Coming up, the Gila River Indian community in Arizona has opened the doors to its fourth casino. We have all of the details. Plus, Washington is the latest state to undertake an exploration of its traumatic boarding school history. And we hear from the writer of a short film streaming on Disney Plus about a Northern Cheyenne two-spirit teen. We have those interviews plus headlines ahead on the ICT Newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. The ICT Newscast is sponsored by the Indian Land Tenure Foundation, a nonprofit organization serving American Indian nations and people in the recovery and control of their rightful homelands. On the web at ILTF.org. Support for the ICT Newscast with Aliyah Chavez comes from the Arizona PBS Studios in Phoenix at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications at Arizona State University. Tenangale, we're so glad you could join us. I'm Mackenzie Allen Charmley. Aliyah Chavez is away. We start today in Washington, D.C., where a newly published report says there were massive failures in state redistricting processes, including for indigenous communities. The National Congress of American Indians joined three other nationwide organizations to publish the report last week. After the 2020 census, numerous states redrew maps for voting districts, which ultimately affects political outcomes and community representation in elections. The report analyzed more than 120 surveys and 60 interviews. It offered grades to states based on their transparency and empowerment for communities of color, finding that only two states received an A grade, while 20 states earned D or F grades. Some with D and F grades included states with high native populations like Wisconsin, North Dakota, and Idaho. Officials from NCAI emphasize that native voices must be included in redistricting efforts to allow for equitable, equitable voting power. Our goal is to remind our communities about all areas of electoral politics year in and year out, and that American Indian Alaska Native voices are needed in so many areas where our tribal nations should be leading. One of the solutions for future redistricting efforts is to create citizen commissions to integrate the public's feedback into maps. Moving internationally, a 21-year-old activist traveled over 4,000 miles to confront a company driving a deforestation in the Amazon. Bikasa Mundaruku, who is Mundaruku, flew to the U.S. to hand the cargo family a letter detailing the environmental damage that the company had been causing in the Amazon. In a statement, she said, in every region where cargo operates, you are destroying the environment and driving out or threatening the communities who live there. The latest threat comes from an over 600-mile-long railroad that would interfere with the lives of several indigenous communities. The company promised to phase out deforestation by 2025. However, the organization still continues the practice on a large scale, in addition to alleged human rights abuses. According to Forbes, Cargill is the largest privately owned company in the U.S. Moving to Michigan, a government program will be re-implemented throughout the state to improve the health of Native Americans. The Intertribal Council of Michigan restarted a program earlier this month that will provide over $1 million in funds to support Michigan tribes. The goal is to increase the health outcomes of indigenous communities who are susceptible to heart disease, cancer, obesity, and other health burdens. Almost one-third of tribal adults in Michigan have been diagnosed with diabetes. According to Department Director Laura Fisher, the program will follow a community-based model that includes culturally tailored strategies to address health disparities among Michigan's indigenous populations. The funding comes from the Racial and Ethnic Approaches to Community Health Program that, funds, that provides support to underserved communities in over 27 states. The money will be spread across seven participating tribes, including the Bay Mills Indian Community, Little Traverse Bay Bands of Ottawa Indians, and the Salt St. Marie Tribe of Chippewa Indians. Staying on the West Coast, the first ever ocean protection area designated by tribal governments has been announced in Sacramento, California. 
three federally recognized tribes in California joined together to announce the Yurok Talawa Daini Indigenous Marine Stewardship Area. It protects nearly 700 square miles of their ancestral ocean and coastal territories and waters. Tribal and state officials are now set to co-manage the area to support critical ecosystems that have high cultural significance to the tribes. The area stretches from the Oregon border and could help California reach its conservation goals for 2030. This designation is the first of its kind in the U.S., but follows examples from First Nations in Canada. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. You have likely heard of the Gila River Indian community if you have ever visited the Phoenix Valley. The people of the river are an alliance of two tribes, the Akamo Otum and the Peeposh. This nation has a storied history. In recent decades, it has found lots of success in gaming, beginning in 1993 when the tribe signed its very first gaming compact. ICT's Aliyah Chavez and Nick Parks visit the, visited the property recently. Let's take a look. So we broke the mold when it comes to casinos for Santan Mountain. Gila River Gaming Enterprises seems to have a knack for finding the perfect place to build a casino. Of the nine casinos in the Phoenix, Arizona Valley, Gila River owns four of them, all located right off major highways. Their casinos are just pieces of the puzzle for the state as a whole. In June, Arizona's Department of Gaming reported that tribally owned casinos contributed over $2 billion to the state since 2004. Here in Chandler, the newest casino in the state is surrounded by lots of empty space, but the tribe could one day decide to add a resort or an entertainment district. Uh, I think there are uh, endless opportunities. Blake Katz-Nelson is the general manager of the Santan Mountain Casino. We've got the mountain views, we've got the open and airiness, and I think that's what people really enjoy is that it's not just a, a dark casino where all I can do is gamble. Oh no, this is a place where I can have a fun experience. I'm entertained, I'm having fun, we're laughing and we're, we're hanging out. There are almost a thousand slot machines here. Actually, it's 813 to be exact. Yeah, so uh, obviously we're, we're owned by Gila River Gaming Enterprises, so we're one entity, right? Uh, but the tribe owns that entity, so all of the revenue that the tribe gets come from the, com uh, the, the casinos. So all their schools, their housing, their um, safety services, when they pick up and dial 911 and that police officer or that fire engine shows up, that's because of the revenues that they've been able to get from these casinos that are in operation. The other thing that people don't necessarily know is that the state benefits from that as well. So there's a percentage that goes back to the state. So even if you're you know, down the street in Chandler and you call 911, a part of those services are part of uh, what the casino has to offer up in regards to revenue. So it's, it's a win-win for everybody. Just about everything here is new from the carpets to the water fountains, and it was designed to feature art from the Akamel Adam and Peeposh people. When you first walk in, you are greeted with a large chandelier created by community members. On the walls, there are these murals representing the seven regions of the tribe. The cool thing about it is each entrance actually faces one of the direct directions, which is northeast, south, and west. And in the Gila River Indian community culture, those are color-coded. So if you come to our north entrance, uh, that entrance is blue. And if you come to the east entrance, that entrance is yellow. And sun rises with, uh, in the east, so that is yellow. And the sun sets in the west, so that side is uh, maroon. So it kind of all plays a, a little part into uh, the property, which is, which is an awesome story. It's something our team members were able to tell all of our guests as they arrived on properties, all the cool little things that we had. The property is also unique in the way that it gets water and electricity. For the water here, we drilled a well, so there's a, a water reserve underneath. So we, our water is completely from that well. Uh, the electricity comes from Grikua, which is Gila River Indian Community Utility Authority, so it's their own utilities. Casino officials tell me their biggest claim to fame here is their sports book which for you non-gamblers is basically a place where folks can bet on major sporting events like the latest NFL game. They get to watch the games on this 130-foot LED video wall where they can play just about anything. It is the largest of its kind in the Phoenix Valley. 
cool. This, the sports book is the only other thing that we have a big claim to fame. So if you walk by, our, our sports book is the largest uh, casino sports book in the Valley. Uh, with our partnership with BetMGM, we really knocked that one out of the park. And thus far, when we hold uh, UFC fight nights, uh, in which we show all the UFC fights, or just with football season that just started, we're seeing that the, that sports book at full occupancy on Sundays and Saturday nights. So it's been a lot of fun. I think that is the other wow factor that we we show here, is that when they walk in and they see that sports book, it is the coolest place to be. Reporting from Santan Mountain Casino, Aliyah Chavez, ICT News. to Washington State where a native-led Truth and Reconciliation Advisory Committee has launched an inquiry into the abuses, traumas, and legacy of the state's Indian boarding schools. But panel members say one thing should be clear from the outset, don't call them schools. ICT's Stuart Huntington has more. Yakima citizen Edward Washines is one of five native leaders tasked with telling the story of the boarding school era in Washington State. E. The National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition has identified 17 such schools that operated in Washington beginning in the 1860s. The advisory panel, working with the state's attorney general, is to issue a report in 2025. Washines is blunt when he refers to the institutions. I wish people would make common out schools because they were not schools. For all intents and purposes, we have schools today. We have our own tribal schools. So we know what schools are. We know what the purpose is. The purpose of those, yes, were not education. I would rather refer to them as concentration camps and not schools. Fellow committee member Tamika Lamir agrees. People that are not educated about the Indian um, concentration camps um, still think that when you think of the word boarding school and in the context that we think about today, like you think that this is some prestigious elite school that we're getting sent to, you know, to become, you know, well-educated and all of that, um, when that was not the case. Um, it was anything but um, good, shall I say. No, they're not schools. Because if they were schools, we would not have some of the lowest graduation rates and academic performance in the nation. The task for today, fully acknowledge the past and build a better future. Well, number one, my my role, my individual role and interests in, in this group is for the benefit of the future of our children uh, and that uh, the recognition of uh, the atrocities that occurred during the uh, establishments of the residential camps uh, that uh, what it did to our people in terms of uh, the total goal of annihilation of our culture, our tradition, as a means of uh, getting rid of our people, uh, doing the way with our, our people in terms of beginning with the wars, wars that were put on to our people. Many of them refer to them as Indian wars, but they were not Indian wars. Our, our people did not wage war on the United States government. All our people were doing was protecting our people. We had protecting our fellows, our people, our women, our children, our elders, and uh, it caused a lot of trauma in that a lot of children uh, in Yakima families were removed forcibly from their families. Uh, they were taken and uh, put into the sporting school and were uh, captured in terms of uh, why they had to uh, remain, be in captivity at, at this uh, residential encampment. Um, concentration camps is what I refer to them. Uh, looking back at uh, uh, the Nazi regime, the Nazi era, what happened to the Jewish people was no different with 
what the United States military did, did to our people in terms of these uh, camps, concentration camps that they refer to as schools. Um, education was not the focus of attention. Educating our people was not the intent of these camps being directed because they were uh, built by the United States government to, uh, as many heard, uh, save the Indian, kill the man, or save it. Yeah, save the save the man, kill the Indian. And uh, so their intent was to get rid of our culture, tradition, to our language, our songs, our ceremonies, our clothes, clothing, those kinds of things, and to assimilate us into Western modern civilization. And uh, which caused a lot of hardship on our people, mainly the children themselves, because they were small, young in nature, but, but also the parents of these children uh, who tried to maintain, retain their children in their villages uh, were not able to. And so it caused a lot of trauma. Uh, there was a lot of deaths that occurred within these schools. And, which shouldn't have happened. The effort in Washington comes after Canada convened a Truth and Reconciliation Commission in 2007 to address the history of what are known as residential schools there, and after the Department of the Interior issued a landmark report in 2022 on its initial findings on the boarding school era. In Washington, the process is just beginning. We're going to hold a series of six to seven public hearings throughout the state of Washington. And it promises to be emotional. So, as a Indigenous woman, um, majority of us are survivors or are descendants of survivors from these these uh, these institutions, these concentration camps. And um, one of my grandmas, um, my great grandmas, so it's my mother's mother's mother. Um, her name is Cecilia Gardapi. Um, she was sent to. The, a boarding school in North Dakota, the Wapaton boarding school when she was a little girl. And I would ask my grandmother about her parents, um, you know, and, and who is her, her mom and her grandparents. And she'd always tell me that her mom, so who I'm referring to, Cecilia Gardapi, was an orphan. And I never understood that as I, you know, started finding out more about our family history and, um, and just her thinking because she got sent to a boarding school that made her an orphan when she actually had parents that cared about her and took care of her. The inquiry, importantly, will be native led. And it is absolutely our time for us to share our narrative and for us to lead this charge in, again, whatever that's going to look like. But we absolutely have to be the, the leads because we are the ones that have been mostly impacted, so it just makes sense that we are the ones leading this. The new initiative in Washington is also unfolding against the backdrop of efforts elsewhere in the country. The state of Colorado just released a report on the history of the boarding institutions there. That effort was spurred by work being done at Fort Lewis College, once the site of a boarding school where at least 31 students died. It is now a vibrant college with a 39% native student body and a curriculum rich in indigenous values. This experience in examining our history um, with the Fort Lewis Indian Boarding School uh, has been really an important process for us um, in recognizing how critical it is to confront our history, to learn from it, uh, but also how we utilize this knowledge um, as an opportunity to heal the way that we can reshape what education can and should look like for Indigenous students uh, and for Indigenous communities in a way that benefits and helps Indigenous community uh, communities to thrive, tribal nations to thrive. And I think that it's, it's so powerful uh, for us to take this opportunity to truly reflect on that history, to learn from it. Uh, and uh, we have students who have the opportunity to come out here and learn from um, traditional knowledge keepers, 
um, not just about farming practices and food sovereignty, but in a way that also incorporates spirituality and cultural knowledge that they can take back to their home communities, uh, that they can utilize to build healthier futures. And so when I think about that, I think about our students are really creating their futures. They're bringing new futures into existence that, um, that center indigenous knowledge uh, and indigenous culture in a way that uh, is so powerful. Reporting from Carbondale, Colorado, Stuart Huntington, ICT News. The committee's eventual report will include recommendations on how the state can address the harm done by Indian boarding schools and other termination practices. Disney's Launchpad is a collection of live action shorts from a new generation of dynamic filmmakers. This season showcased Northern Cheyenne writer Adam Parker with its short film titled The Roof. ICT's Paris Wise has the story. After being sent to stay with their grandfather, a Northern Cheyenne teen discovers a connection to their family and community in a way they never thought possible. Adam Parker, writer of The Roof, tell us more about this story and the inspiration behind writing this short. The Roof is a symbol uh, for what protects people inside the home. And it's a story about two people literally working on a roof, but also needing to connect with each other uh, about the things that they don't talk about in their lives. Uh, and they need to reach out to their family and community in order to heal their own personal traumas. I wrote this story uh, when I was visiting my grandfather after he had a stroke. And I wrote it thinking about what I really wanted to say to him and what I really wanted him to say to me. Uh, my grandpa was born on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation and was sent to boarding school as a kid. And it was the only thing in his life that he would never talk about. Growing up, I wish I'd, I had heard about two spirit people in my tribe. So I wrote this wishing it was the conversation I had with my grandfather at an earlier age. How did Disney get involved and what was it like working with them? They had an open call for scripts and chose mine for season two of Launchpad. And they call it a season because it was produced more like a TV show with six short films all sharing the same crew in Los Angeles. But, you know, even though we had to shoot in L.A., it was important to me that we use digital extensions uh, so that the trees we used in the background were the trees near my grandpa's house in Lame Deer. As the writer, how involved were you in production and being on set? I was very lucky that from day one, the director, Alex Bocchieri, said that he wouldn't take the job if I wasn't involved. So we had a lovely collaboration all the way through the final uh, sound edit. The lead actor, Phoenix Wilson, stars across from West Studi. What was it like to see them bring the story and the characters to life? It was absolutely fantastic. Uh, Phoenix is such a wonderful actor and advocate. And I was very lucky that uh, not only is only Phoenix a wonderful actor, uh, but also had a similar experience and relationship with, with their grandfather growing up as I did. And it was so lovely uh, after Phoenix was cast to bring Phoenix to the Chief's powwow in Lame Deer to introduce Phoenix to the community uh, in the story and uh, get the community uh, involved as much as we could. There are still a lot of barriers and misunderstandings regarding identity, even within Native communities. Can you talk more about your experience on what being Two-Spirit means for you and within the Northern Cheyenne tribe? To me, being Two-Spirit is really a connection and responsibility to community. So I'm really excited um, for the future, uh, especially in my tribe, especially since Last summer, Chief Dole Knife College in Lame Deer had their second annual Two Pride, Two Spirit Pride event, which I never thought I would see happen. And the Northern Cheyenne Tribal Council recently passed a very sweeping resolution in support of Two Spirit tribal members, especially the youth. So I hope that this film adds to the efforts that other people are already making in the tribe. Uh, and it makes me really excited to be a Northern Cheyenne Two Spirit tribal member. In addition to this short, you have written a couple of novels as well as a feature. What can we be on the lookout for next from you? You know, I'm working on my next screenplay and novel and procrastinating on one with another. But uh, more than that, I'm really excited to mentor a couple of Two-Spirit writers and would love to mentor even more.
Speaking of looking forward, what are your views and hopes in how to spirit and queer stories will continue on in media? I couldn't be more excited for a few films from a, a couple other uh, queer indigenous filmmakers that are coming out soon, including Fancy Dance by Erica Tremblay, starring Lily Gladstone, and Frybit Face and Me, uh, written and directed by Billy Luther. To me, uh, the this is just the start of an entire generation and hopefully in a, the next seven generations of Indigenous storytellers. What would your message be to the Two-Spirit youth across Indian country? My hope for Two-Spirit youth that want love and acceptance and help from their community, but maybe they don't know who to reach out to and they don't know where to get it. My hope is that they find it closer than they think and that they find that uh, within their family and community. The Roof is available to stream on Disney+. Plus. Go check it out. Adam Parker, thank you so much for joining us. Nia yeah, Ash, thank you. Well, be sure to join us on the next ICT Newscast. A panel of experts tells us why the word boarding schools could be misleading when talking about truth and reconciliation. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.